I will switch to English <laughs> to uh, mention you. that we, we are receiving today one expert of language in non-human animals, uh, Irene Pepperberg. Uh, I would like to thank you especially for coming, especially for this lecture uh, from uh, the United States, from Harvard University. Uh, Irene Pepperberg has been conducting research on the parrot and the abilities of the parrot for language for uh, many decades. Uh, I think many of you know, uh, in particular, our uh, specific parrot, Alex, with whom she conducted remarkable studies that really pushed what we thought were boundaries uh, of uh, animal cognition. And uh, she has prepared a very long talk where she will go in some detail of what parrots can do and uh, surprise us with what they can do. So without further ado, uh, help me welcome. Uh, thank Irene you Pepper so Pepper. much. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much for having me here. I do speak some French, but not enough to give a lecture in French. So please, I must speak in English. Um, and I want to thank all the people who have helped us over the years, especially all the students. This is a student-powered project. All the students are working in training and testing the birds. So when I began the work in the 1970s, the term avian intelligence was an oxymoron. People felt that birds were totally incapable of doing any kind of clever, clever tasks. In fact, my first grant proposal came back the reviews literally asked me what I was smoking. Uh, and they had good reason, okay? In the 40s and 50s, Maurer had attempted to establish two-way communication between birds and humans using a number of different imitative species. He used the standard operant techniques of the day, Skinner, Skinnerarian behaviorism. For those of you who have not had Psych 101, um, you treat the brain as a black box. You don't, don't worry at all what goes on inside. You start with a stimulus that you present to the animal. You wait for a response. If it's the correct response, you give the animal a little bit of food. The animal is very eager to have that little bit of food because it's starved down to 85% of its normal body weight. Think about how you feel when you've missed lunch, and then imagine being 85% of your body weight. You are so hungry you can't even think straight, and this is one of the problems. Um, in this technique, the bird, the bird was supposed to say for simply hello when he entered the room, which the bird learned to do. But the bird would learn also that hello meant give me food. So the bird would say hello all the time, which was not always appropriate. And so it didn't get rewarded all the time. The behavior was extinguished. The birds learned almost nothing. And this was a serious problem. Uh, Grosslight and Zahner, a few years later, felt that Maurer had not been rigorous enough. They locked birds in sound isolation boxes, played them tapes of human speech. The birds learned nothing from the tapes, but they learned the sounds in the laboratory, people, the sounds of doors opening and closing and water dripping from taps. And everybody knew, of course, that birds in people's homes mimicked different things. So the idea was that, well, they could produce these sounds, but they never could understand what these sounds meant and they were mindless mimics, they were stupid, and that was the end of the story. Until about the 19, early 1970s, Dietmar Tote was a under professor in the laboratory of Otto Kuhler. He was a bioacoustician. He also studied basically bird song in the wild. And his job in, in Kuhler's lab was to teach gray parrots to talk in German. And he basically said, well, in the wild, how do birds learn their songs? They learn by watching and listening to the other birds using their songs in context. So he developed this technique called the model rival or MR technique to train these birds to communicate in German. It was a really amazingly simple technique. We adapted it. When I read about this, I, I realized this was the absolute way to go to do this. And we adapted it. It's very simple. We start with an object the bird really, really wants. The bird is not at all food deprived, but it's deprived of certain toys that it really likes. You hold up the toy. The bird is on a perch. One of the students is the model for the bird's behavior and its rival for my attention. I start out as the teacher. I show the toy to the student. I say, what's this? She says, wood. I said, that's right, it's wood. And I give it to her. She tears it apart, she's excited. Bird is very, very excited too. He wants this, this object. We then exchange, we do this several times, we exchange roles of model rival and trainer. 
So the bird sees that one person is not always the questioner and the other the respondent. So she shows it to me and she says, what's this? And I go, Arr. and she goes, no, you're wrong. This is very important for the bird to see a mistake because then it learns that not every weird noise causes transfer of the object. I get another chance, I say what, I get to play with it. After a while, we give it to the, you know, give the bird a chance. The bird is not going to be able to say it right off. Why? Because it needs to learn how to control many, many muscles in the syrinx, where the sound source is, the trachea, which causes the first formant, only changes about 10% in the parrots, very small. The second formant, which is controlled by the glottis, the larynx, the tongue going back and forth and up and down, just like ours, the beak opening and closing, just like our lips open and close, like you got ah versus e, you feel the difference? Bird has to learn how to control all that. But the bird will start out maybe saying like whoop, okay, a bird-like sound, we reward that initially and then we model it over months till the bird can say wood, remember lips. It's hard, they don't have lips, so some of these sounds are difficult, they have to actually have to learn how to use basically a burping type, type thing, esophageal speech in some cases. Um, but the point of this whole, whole procedure is that we no longer have a black box. We have a social information processing system. And that is because communication is a social function, and that's how the birds learn in a social situation. Using this technique, um, my most famous parrot, Alex, we worked with him for 30 years. He learned to identify labels for about 100 different objects and foods and some actions. He learned to label colors and shapes and materials. Not only did he learn their labels, but he understood the categorical labels, hierarchically of color, material, and shape, so that he knew that color was a hierarchical label under which went blue, green, purple, yellow, shape, two, three, four, five, six, cornered, material, wood, paper, cork, things like that, okay. So he had these concepts of categories. He had a concept of same or different, a very advanced concept, not just identity versus non-identity, but you could give him any two objects and say what is same and what is different. And he would say color, shape, or matter, depending on which aspect was same or different. And he learned absence, so he could say none if nothing were same or different. Okay, this is really important because absence is a difficult concept to learn. He understood relative size. Take any two objects, what color bigger, what color smaller, what matter bigger, what matter smaller. And without any training, he transferred the concept of none from same difference. So the first time I showed him two things of the same size and asked what's same, he could tell me none. Okay, again, he could transfer concepts, which again is very, very important. Um, he learned via, we also found out he learned via joint attention, um, just like little children, whom if they're playing with a toy on the floor and you say you, you're jointly attending to it with them and you say, oh, it's a truck, it's your red truck, we're playing with the truck, they learn the label truck. We did studies to show that if your back was turned and you were talking about the truck but there was no joint attention, neither the children nor our birds would recognize that you were talking about that object and they wouldn't learn the label. So again, importance of social interaction and learning. Um, there was recursion, not in the mathematical sense, um, not in the, the linguistic sense, rather, the way we talk about, in, in America, there is a little children's um, ditty. This is the house that Jack built. This is the cat that bit the rat that ate the cheese that lived in the house that Jack built. So you have this recursive embedding of phrases. Alex couldn't do anything quite that way, but he understood recursive, recursion in a more mathematical sense where he understood if you gave him a tray of things, you could say what object is green and three corners with conjunction, or what material is blue and three corners, or what color is three corners and wood, and things like that. So he could understand how you were embedding these different types of phrases. I mentioned conjunction, uh, mentioned transfer already, intention, his vocalizations were intentional. He had phrases like, I want X and want to go Y, where X and Y were appropriate object or location labels. And if he said he wanted a banana and you gave him a grape, he would literally take the grape and throw it at you and repeat, you know, want banana. So these were meaningful, intentional phrases. And there was fast mapping of a sort. Again, a different type of fast mapping than in children, but he would come up with different phrases and different 
labels himself. So he understood that, for example, rock was a hard object and he had soft, dried corn and he came up with the label rock corn to describe it. He would play with the sounds. So he learned grape from seeing, you know, our labeling the food as we handed it to him. But then he came up with grain, chain, cane. And when we gave him objects that corresponded to those labels he made up, he mapped them immediately. So this was a kind of a fast mapping. So he was rather a very interesting bird. One of the really important things that we did with him was number work, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that today. So I just want you to hear a little bit of him. Wheat, a little shredded cereal. Okay, so just a little bit, okay. So we had, um, we've been studying so many different things in the laboratory. Today I'm going to give you a very brief summary of work on number concepts, delayed gratification. For those of you who know the marshmallow test, we'll talk about that. Piagetti and liquid conservation and a recent study on probabilistic reasoning. So the number concepts, this was quite, quite interesting. We could show Alex a tray like this of many different objects all mixed up together. And we could ask him, okay, how many rows wool, okay? And particularly since they were different sizes, he had to actually pay a lot of attention to what we were asking him. Um, we weren't sure if he could really count at this point, but we certainly knew that he could perceive these different objects. He, because it was a conjunction of color and material, he couldn't do it by a simple perceptual pop out. If you give this to humans, they have to count to do this type of task. And he could do this for up to eight objects. And this was quite a sophisticated task. And this is a, a little video of him doing this. I want to make it very clear this was a, a particular type of video. We usually would give him a tray like this and we'd ask a question and go on. And we never would repeat the question or the task in a given session because we didn't want him to get sort of clued into this, oh, today we're just going to do math and tomorrow we're going to do shapes. So we mixed up all the tasks. But I was doing a um, presentation at the Media Lab and they asked me to ask numerous questions to this one tray to make sure that it wasn't just, oh, he sees the tray and he says four. So I repeat it and he's very, gets very upset and you see him shaking his head and the first time he responds quickly, then he's, he's, he doesn't understand what's going on. This tray should have disappeared. He should have gotten his treatment gone away. So you'll see this very interesting behavior. He's not happy. Now he's really unhappy. Okay, so we had production, but what about comprehension? Um, and this is, you know, not necessarily production comprehension mean the same thing. Karen Wynn showed that you could show young children, say, say four marbles and say how many, and the child would go one, two, three, four, four marbles. You think the child understands. You then give the child a big bowl of marbles and you say, give me four. And the child takes a handful and goes, here because they don't truly understand counting out at that stage. So we had to study production. So we gave Griffin, uh, we gave Alex the same type of tray, but now there were a number of different objects of different colors, and we'd say, what color six? So we had to find the six objects and tell us the color. 
And we did this 15 years after we did the production study for reasons unrelated to number. There were just a lot of other things we were doing in the lab. And he's very good on about the first 10 trials, 10, 12 trials. And then I have to say he gets bored. This is, this is terribly boring. It's the same objects. The tray keeps coming back. And he starts acting out. He would look at the tray, take his beacon, throw everything off. He would turn around and start preening. Or the worst thing was if there were you know, red, blue, and green things on the tray, and I'd say, what color for? He'd say yellow, purple, orange, all the colors that were not on the tray. So I come in one day and I ask, you know, what color three? And there are you know, three, four, and six things on the tray. And he looks at me and he goes, five. And there's no five things on the tray. I'm going, Alex, come on, what color three? Five. And we go back and forth several times. And he's, but he's not throwing things on the tray, off the tray. He's not turning his back. He's not giving me odd colors. So I finally look at him and I say, okay, what color five? And he looks at me and he goes, none. So what he had done was transferred the concept of absence from same and different to an absence of a set of objects. This was a zero-like concept. I mean, we didn't have that in Western civilization until the 1600s. And he did this on his own. And even more compelling to me was that he had figured out how to manipulate me into asking the question he wished to answer. So we, we had this zero-like concept. Um, he could do addition. So we would give him um, sets of objects. There were a couple, like one nut under here, two nuts under here, and you'll see the, the task. He says it very softly. Yes. So he doesn't see the set of objects when he's answering. He has to remember what's under the cups. And he would add up to eight. We went, all later went to three cups. And we also went to putting Arabic numerals under the cups. And this was important because we had trained him on Arabic numerals. We'd give him a tray like this. The question would be, what color for? Or what number blue? To train him, in the absence of sets of objects, to label these, for him, just squiggles, OK, with the same labels that represented blobs of things. And this was important because we wanted to see if he understood this equivalence without any training. So for example, that the, the vocal label six represented comprehension and production, six blobs of something. Comprehension and production, a squiggle. Could he understand without any training, unlike all the other animals that had been trained on these types of tasks, the equivalence of these things? We had to make the task interesting, and we had to make it so that we could ask it multiple times, and he couldn't just get to under learn something. So we would ask him the, to label the color of the bigger or smaller numeral. So we'd ask what color big, number bigger or what color number smaller. The only way he could do it is if he understood that five represented some five blobs of something, and two represented a different set of blobs of something else. Um, this showed not only that he understood equivalence, but that he inferred the ordinality of his numerals. Now, this was really important for two reasons. First of all, because apes, in contrast, had to be trained to do this. Even an ape that could, at 90% accuracy, when you show it you know, two jelly beans, go over to a tray and point to the Arabic two, it had to be trained hundreds of trials to put those Arabic numerals in order. Alex did not need the training. What was made it even more striking was that he hadn't learned his numbers in order. It turns out that when we started studying numbers, he understood three corner for a triangle and four corner for a square. So we started with the numerals three and four, because he could say them already. Then we trained him on two and five and then on six and one. Turns out one was the absolute hardest number for him to learn because he already could label one key as a key and convincing him that he now had to say one key was, was quite difficult. 
But he had, had learned all these, these things. And the other important thing about this is that children make the inference of their ordinality only when they're about four years old. I may be going ahead of myself on the slides here, but what happens is when you start training a child with numbers, you start when they're about, they're about two and a half years old, roughly, and they'll learn one versus many. It takes them nine more months to learn one versus two versus many. It takes about another five months for them to learn one versus two versus three versus many. And at around this time, they're also learning a number line. So you ask a, a child to count, three-year-old child to count, three-and-a-half-year-old child to count, and they'll say, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And they don't quite understand the meaning of it. It's like when they learn the alphabet and they think L-M-N-O-P is one letter. Okay? But around the time a child turns four, and again, it's not exactly that. Some children are younger, some children are older, but about that time, they put this all together and they make the connection that the successor function, that each number in the number line is one more than the number before it. So you never teach a normal child about five. They infer that ordinality and deduce the cardinality of five, six, seven from their order in the number line. Okay, nobody had ever shown that in a non-human. And again, as I said, oops, I was ahead of myself. So the other thing that was very interesting is that for all the animals that were trained with numbers, they all learned their numbers quite slowly. Just like the children who took several months to learn one versus two versus three, all of these animals learned their numbers very slowly. But as I mentioned, children, once they got to five, six, seven, whatever, it was very fast. None of the animals, including Alex, had learned their numbers, the larger numbers, quickly. But in Alex's case, remember, there was this issue of vocal productivity. He wasn't unlike the ape, simply pointing to a number line or pressing a computer screen button. He had to learn how to say seven or six or five with lips. And he had no lips. Imagine going five, five without lips. It took a long time for him to learn to control all those muscles. So when I was a Radcliffe Fellow at Harvard, Sue Carey and Liz Spelke and I decided what would happen if we trained Alex on the Arabic numerals seven and eight in the absence of blobs of things and then trained him on their relationship to six. Could he then infer their ordinality? Now this is important because even if he learned that you know, seven was greater than six and eight was greater than seven, they still could mean 10 or 20. They didn't necessarily mean one more. Now every other time things were one more or one less, but we had no knowledge of what he would do in this case. So we trained him, it took several months to train him to say all these new, new letters, and new Arabic numbers, we were also training him, this is the interesting, we were also training him to identify letters at the time, to say like B for B and E for I and things like that. So he didn't even know initially that these new things were numbers until we trained him on their relationship to six and seven. But the first time we showed him seven blobs of something on a tray and eight blobs of something on a tray, he correctly identified them, okay? And so he had identified the cardinality from an ordinal set, just like children. And we did the appropriate control trials. So we put nine things on a tray, six, seven, and nine things on a tray, and asked him, you know, what color eight, thinking that if he just went to the largest number of things, he would give us the color of the set of nine. But he said none. So he knew exactly what these things meant. And a paper came, Sue, Carrie, and I wrote the paper on this. And again, it was, it was the first time anybody showed this in non-humans. So he was much more like children than like the apes. The delayed gratification test, a totally different topic here. Okay, those of you may be familiar with the marshmallow test with children. In the 1970s, uh, Michelle, a professor then at Stanford, took 600 children, one at a time, put them in a room, put a marshmallow on a plate and said, you can eat this anytime you want. I'm gonna go run an errand. But if you wait till I come back, I will give you two marshmallows. Okay. 
And, you know, this was, this was quite a task. Not many of the children, not all the children think they were four years old. For a four-year-old child, 15 minutes is a lifetime, okay? And to sit there with this marshmallow, just looking at it. Um, but the children who did succeed distracted themselves in various different ways. They would push the marshmallow away, they would sing and dance. They, you, you've probably seen the YouTube videos on all these children, okay? The really interesting thing was that when Michelle tracked these children 30 years later, it turns out that those had waited, had, you know, had better you know, grades in college, they had gone on to have better careers, they were making more money, their marriages lasted better. So the idea was they had much more successful lives and that this idea of being able to wait suggested an ability to plan for the future, to exhibit self-control and things like that. So um, the task can involve waiting for more, it can advance for waiting for something better, okay? The experimenter could be in the room or out of the room. Michelle tested all those different types of things. Um, it's been done with many other non-humans. Apes seem to be able to wait for more and for better. They'll wait for about 10 minutes. Okay, birds, all the birds that have been tested so far, the corvins and one species of parrot could only wait for better. They couldn't wait for more. They could only wait for better and they could only wait for a very short amount, relatively short amount of time. Only one crow waited for about 10 minutes. Um, now we had a, a parrot in the lab, Griffin, another gray parrot who'd been trained the same way as Alex, and he understood the term wait, okay? In the course of the laboratory, he had to wait when I came in, come in in the morning. He wants to come in immediately be on me, to sit on my shoulder, but he has to wait till I take off my outdoor shoes, till I use hand sanitizer, he must wait. Twice a day he gets fed cooked grains. They're initially too hot, so he has to learn to wait until they cool down. So this meant just telling him to wait. It wasn't that he understood about choosing to wait. In these situations he had no choice, he, but he did understand the label wait. So now we decided to see if he really understood what it meant. And we gave him 10 trials for each different types of delays, different types of times for visible and invisible conditions. So sometimes the trainer had the, the better treat sitting there. She wasn't looking at him, but she'd have it waiting. Sometimes she left the room. Okay, and we mixed up these times so that he never knew how long he was gonna wait. He could, sometimes it could be 10 seconds, sometimes it could be 15 minutes. We also did control trials for each condition in which we gave him the better reward first and this was important because it meant that weight, we were testing to see if weight was a command or a choice. I mean, you, you have a dog and you, you, you train it to wait, you put a biscuit on its nose and it sits there and it waits until you give it the command and then it can flip the biscuit and eat it. Well, we wanted to see if that's what Griffin was doing or if he understood it was a choice. So if we gave him the better thing first and he understood it was a choice, he should look at us, go, huh? And eat it immediately, all right. And again, all these delay times and all the conditions were randomized so he could not figure out how long it was. And the other thing that was very important for all of the other animals, they were given longer trials each time they waited. So it was as though they were being trained to wait longer. If they waited for 10 seconds, then they were tested on 40 seconds. If they waited 40 seconds, they were tested for 100 seconds. But this was all mixed up, so we weren't training him the way those other animals were trained. Okay. So, um, and again, the corvids, what they did, it was very clever. Most of them were caching birds. And so what they do, they'd pick up the treat and they'd hide it under the substrate or they'd, they'd stick it under something so they didn't have to look at it while they were waiting. Griffin, that he couldn't do something like that. That was not possible. So he had to sit there with it. Um, the cockatoos that were tested, these poor cockatoos were given a, two different types of nuts, one that they liked and one that they really, really liked. And so they had to hold the pecan in their beak and not eat it until they could trade it out for a cashew, which they liked better. They couldn't wait very long, but imagine holding something in your mouth and not being able to eat it. So Griffin's task was easier because we didn't make him do that. So this is the way we did it. We showed him the two possible treats and they were different treats on every trial. We had a series of different types of treats so it wasn't always waiting for a nut or waiting for this. 
Sometimes the nut was the better reward, sometimes it was not. So we'd give them a choice between a cranberry and a nut where the nut was a better reward, or a nut versus a Skittle, which is a little um, treat, a, a candy that kids like, and he liked the, the Skittle much better. So it was never a given thing, oh, it's a nut, I just sit and wait. Everything changed on every trial. So then we put our hand over the first treat, we said wait, and we removed the better treat, and, except it was a control, and he had to sit there looking at it. Okay, it turns out he succeeded on all the trials. Um, basically, he did very, very well on this. He, on the control trials, he appropriately failed. He would look at us, wait about a second, and then just eat the better food reward, okay? But on all the other ones, he waited, um, and was not a command, so we knew it was not a command. Um, basically, the other thing was, he also didn't care because he didn't care about, didn't wait simply because he didn't care about the treat. Some of his actual failures, there was a 15 minute run where he waited for 14 minutes and 45 seconds and then he finally gave up and ate it. So he was obviously still interested in what was sitting in front of him. It wasn't just that he had lost interest in what was going on. Okay. And again, he wasn't learning over time. We did a bunch of regressions. Um, he did make more fail had more failures at the beginning of the trials, but overall it was not, not a significant trend. Um, basically, he was not learning the task. Okay. And what was really interesting, and this is the fun part of this, he did the same types of behaviors while he was waiting as the young children. Oops. And this is a split screen video. So he's told to wait like a little kid. She pushes it away, he throws it. She takes a little tiny bite. He tastes it and asks, puts it away. She's falling asleep. Watch his eyes. He starts to try to not look at it, close his eyes. This little kid is dancing around. He's floofing. He's trying to distract himself. This time, hey, sometimes he did fail. So the little boy eats it and he eats his nut. Again, she tastes it, and she, tastes it. she just tastes a little tiny bite. Here, the little kid is distracting himself, turns around, Griffin's turning around, preening, trying to distract himself, things, all these behaviors. Okay. So the Piagetti and conserva liquid conservation, I feel like I'm talking to the, the choir here, singing to the choir on this, but it's a inferential task, of course, and it's advanced capabilities, and it involves perceptual abilities as well. Um, I mean, adults get the idea immediately. If you take two, be two beakers of the same amount of liquid and pour it into two different sized Beakers, and you say, which one do you want? Humans may say, well, I want the tall, thin one because it's more fun to drink out of that. But they know it's the same quantity. If children are about five years old, though, they think that it's literally a different amount, that by pouring it into a tall, thin versus a short, fat beaker, it's a different amount. What would happen if we tested our birds on that? Great apes have been tested on things like that, but they're, they use an over-conservation task where there's always more quantity in one of the beakers. And that's not what you give children. So we didn't want to do that. We wanted to test our birds exactly the same way. And we tested, this time we tested four gray parrots. We had Griffin, who was 19 at the time, Athena, who was a chick when we started. She was six months old. Um, at that point, she couldn't pay attention to anything, so we could look at her developmentally. And there were two birds that uh, belonged to friends of mine who had worked in the lab, and they understood our procedures. And the other important thing, and this may sound funny, but it's not, the husband is a nuclear naval submarine commander. So when I give them a protocol, it is followed absolutely exactly because he understands the importance of 
doing that, okay? So I could trust them. It wasn't like I just gave it to some, you know, people who were only gonna give me the trials in which their birds succeeded because they wanted their birds to succeed. And we did this because we wanted to find out if there was something about the training, and particularly the language training that our birds had, that made a difference, okay? So we mixed up the order in which the birds saw the task. Different birds saw the task in different orders. Um, basically, three of them were done on the, the more standard procedure, where you first show them the invisible transfer. You just show them a tall, thin, short, fat, and you say, which do you want? Uh, and then you give them a separate set of trials where you pour the liquid and then give them a choice. Griffin, however, we did it first, we showed him the transfer because we wanted to see if a bird could do this at all, all right? So the idea was if he chose randomly after seeing the transfer, then we could test everything else and see what was going on, okay. We used US standard teaspoons and tablespoons. We filled them with various amounts of juice. Um, and sometimes the choices were between spoons that were full and sometimes partially full. Sometimes there were two spoons that were both partially full. Um, and this was basically the way it was. So this was a more versus less task. We had to make sure that they would always choose what they thought was more. So we had to test if they choose when there really was more. And this is Athena, this one is full, this one is not. We put them there, we then push that up and let her have a choice. Okay, it turns out all the birds succeeded on more, except when Athena was a chick, when she was six months old, she didn't care about anything. She didn't even care about drinking the juice. But you could see developmentally when she was nine months, she succeeded whether we had teaspoons or tablespoons as the choices. Um, Franco was very interesting. We had done a previous task with him where he actually, after it was an interesting task. If he chose a nut that sat on a piece of white paper, he could also eat the nut that sat on the black paper. But if he chose the nut that sat on the black paper, he could only get that one. And it was an interesting type of task. So when we started this, he thought he could actually have both choices of, of juice. So in the first two trials, he was very upset when he made a choice and it disappeared on him. So that's why he didn't quite get it the first time, but they understood more versus less. Okay, this was the conservation um, data. So here's Griffin. It turns out he was random the first time we showed it to him, so he understood, okay, that the transfer meant that the transfer doesn't change the amount of liquid, so when we gave him the invisible transfer, he already knew what the, the amounts looked like, so he was random there. Athena chose what looked like the more amount when she couldn't see the transfer, but was random when she could. The same for Franco, the same for Pepper. And then for Pepper, we wanted to see, because Pepper was the same age as Griffin, what if we gave her a couple, some more trials after she had seen this, and then she would re replicated Griffin's data. So once she had seen the transfer and knew what was going on, she also said, I know what's going on here, you can't fool me. So this was a test that basically showed these birds, including a two-year-old gray, could do this task at the level of five-year-old children, five or six-year-old children. And this was a, um, this is Athena doing one of the trials. So she sees the transfer. And she looks and looks. And then she chooses, she, this one, she ch actually chose the one that looked like there was less in it, but she knew it was the same amount of, of liquid. Okay. So the final study I'm gonna talk about today is a new study we've done in our lab, and it's probabilistic reasoning. The idea of being able to make a generalization about a sample based on information about a population. Um, depending on the task, it can be observed in children as young as seven months or not until about seven years. And why is there a big difference? Well, this is, this is very interesting. Okay. When you do it with the very young children, you do it as a looking time task. And you basically are asking them to do a post hoc te um, test of what surprises them or not. With the older children, you're asking them to pre make a prediction and talk about what they're predicting. Okay. So with the young children, for example, um, experimenters shake a big box and they pull out certain 
numbers of things from the box, and they can either be, you know, lots of dark ones or a few dark ones, and then they show them the box. And the children look longer if there's improbable match between what they're expecting, supposedly expecting, based on the populations. Okay. Um, the problem is that, you know, it's not necessarily understanding so much about the proportions as tracking novelty. That, hey, the difference is exciting, so you might look more longer at that just because there is a difference, okay, a perceptual mismatch. Um, that doesn't under mean you understand the proportions. Okay, there's other tasks with looking times where these things are kind of bouncing around, a curtain drops, and then one object falls out. And the children look longer if it's the minority item versus the majority item because of the idea that there are, you know, it's technically more of these. But it depends a lot on whether this thing is at the opening or not, and just interesting of it's a more novel object. Okay, they're seeing a lot of blue things, one red thing, maybe the red thing is just more interesting as it comes out. Um, the people, the, this one is again the rotation, depends on whether it's near or whether it's far, and again the children respond on, on, a sort, on a probabilistic level, but again, it's not entirely clear what they're basing it on. And um, they may just be basing it on, on various things like nearness and stuff like that. Um, the people who did these studies actually did a bunch of additional controls to try to you know, rule out all those types of different things. But the older children, this is the task the older children see. Basically, there's a bu bucket a bunch of blue things and a bunch of red things fall into the bucket. The can is then shaken. Somebody puts their hand in, pulls out a block, and says, what color do you think this is? So the kids have to make a prediction. Okay, they're not just responding to something or other, but they have to make a prediction. And it turns out that children have to be between five and seven years old to do that, okay? Before that, they will we'll answer very sketchily. They might say, red because it's my favorite color, okay? Or, well, or sometimes you give this them a couple of trials like this, and they'll say, well, last time it was blue, so I'm gonna guess red this time because it's red's turn to do this, okay? Um, only later, when they are, you know, about six or older, children will start saying, well, blue because it's the mostest, and they're getting some idea of how the proportions in, are related to the probability. Now, again, a lot, as I said, we had lots of different controls, but, you know, again, the children, younger children succeeded on tests where some of the older children were having troubles. And again, we thought that this had to do with the idea of post hoc versus pre hoc type things and the idea of expectations. And again, that the older children actually have to understand, too, that even though the proportions are, say, are in the favor of the blue, it doesn't guarantee that blue is going to come out. When Gopnik did a bunch of studies with these things, she looked at what's called a sort of a sampling hypothesis when she did it with a number of children. And it turns out that, you know, every once in a while they're sampling the possibility that, well, you know, it doesn't guarantee that this is going to happen. So we wanted to see, we, we had a parrot who could talk, and we basically could test this. We also um, noticed that when they did the studies with the children, there was a, a lot of um, sensitivity to proportion of the items. As the proportions got closer to 50-50, children had more difficulty, which you would make sense. Um, it depended on which, the, order, of which, the uh, order in which things were put into the box and stuff like that. And um, the other thing is that even the older children, um, when they were tracking the higher proportions, also still sometimes had trouble with the task. Okay, they didn't initially get it. So um, we also realized when we looked at the child's data that when ch children would do better if they were cued be just before being asked and saying again, which is the mostest, all right? And that would help them answer. So again, was it that the kids were really remembering what was going on or were just they being cued what to say? So again, um, we were very interested, what could our bird do? There is only one other study in non-humans on this type of task with apes. And because of the way the task was administered, again, it wasn't exactly the way it was shown to the children. And different types of induction could have been used. 
So the apes were shown buckets of very proportions of carrots and banana chips. They liked the banana chips much more. And they were asked, you know, which bucket would you choose to have me draw something from in order to get a, a um, thing? And unlike the children and our parrot, these buckets were always available for them to look at while they were making their choices. The children and eventually our bird had to remember what was in these, had to have a representation of what was in the buckets. So that was one thing that made it easier for the apes. The also thing is with the apes is that each of these different tasks had a different, the apes could use a different strategy for all these different things. So they could simply avoid a banana free bucket, okay, or a bucket tainted with carrots and something like that. There's a study that shows, there's some other studies that shows that if you give uh, animals a, like a piece of cheese and a carrot versus a piece of cheese and you think they, they like carrots, they eat them, that they choose the cheese and carrot because they get two things. They actually choose just the cheese because it's the, the carrot is somehow tainting the cheese because um, it's not as good in some way. And maybe that was an issue here. So not all these different trials had these different controls and the apes could have been using different types of um, ideas and, and ways of dealing with the task. So given all these problems that I've talked about, we wanted to see what Griffin would do if we gave him the exact task you give the older children. You put a bunch of things in the bucket, proportion of one to three, and ask him, what do you think is gonna come out? We did different type, because he could talk and he could identify lots of different things, we used different sets of objects and different proportions, of different relative proportions. So we'd say use keys, three keys and one cork on one trial, and then three corks and one key on another trial. We used wood, pieces of wood and pieces of paper. We used all these different combinations. So we couldn't just look at it and say, oh, you know, cork is the right answer and stuff like that. Um, now, in the human trials, you basically give, take 100 kids and you give them one or two trials, maybe three trials to see what happens. We had one talking parrot at this point. So we gave him 96 trials. And we had to do this over a very long period of time so he wouldn't get bored. Um, we had a number of trials where we'd put up the, as soon as he'd see the bucket, he'd turn around like Alex and start preening and we didn't want to work, but 96 trials over the course of a very long time. We separated the sessions by, you know, many days. We only did one or two trials a day. And to keep him interested, again, we used, we, there was also studies that showed that mass and contour could be an issue on this stuff. So you use lots of different sets of items. We um, put foam in the bottom of the bucket so he couldn't hear what we were dropping in the bucket, like a key might clink differently than a cork and stuff like that. And we also um, basically tested the order. We looked at the order of which we put things in, if that affected him. Now he did track the probability. Interestingly, he tracked it 73 out of 96 times, he said the majority, and 23 times he said the minority. And this is over all of the tasks. He didn't guess the right thing at the right time, okay, necessarily. But if you went through all these tasks, he basically was tracking, was sampling, doing the sampling. The type of object didn't matter. It didn't matter whatever the samples were. He, he did it perfectly well. Um, the primacy versus recency effects. Would he remember the first thing we dumped in the bucket or the most recent thing we bumped, dumped in the back bucket? Um, he did show a slight recency effect, but statistically it wasn't significant. And um, did it matter if he was doing sort of the gambler's fallacy? Like if we had just pulled the minority thing, would he answer majority? Or would he be more likely to answer minority after we just pulled the majority? And no, we tested that out and it wasn't the case. It didn't matter what he was doing on that. So basically, um, and we pulled the minority out 25% of the time, but it didn't you know, it didn't cue him in any particular way. He just was tracking the probability of the set. And again, if you think about this, it's not really optimal. You should always say the majority thing, right? Because there's always three times more of one thing than another. Okay, but if you think about what humans do when they're given, you know, when they're playing cards or when they're playing roulette or something like that, they start tracking. If they know the roulette, things are coming up 40% red, they start guessing 
and betting 40%. So this is what he was doing. He was tracking the probability. And ecologically, it kind of makes sense. I mean, you go to the place more likely to provide food, but occasionally you got to check out the other patches because maybe you'll beat the other birds to that particular patch or something like that, OK? So now we need to see if he's going to shift his probability as we shift the proportions, OK? And if he can also track over multiple containers. But still, this was really an interesting, amazing thing that he could do this. And again, we could only do this with a talking parrot because he had to be able to identify the objects. So in sum, um, I hoped I've convinced you that gray parrots are basically working at the level of at least a five-year-old child. Their communicative abilities are more like that of a one or a two-year-old ch child. I mean, they only can label things. They don't have, they have phrases. They don't have complicated sentences. I can't come in and say, why did you, you know, bite that student yesterday and have him explain something to me? Um, but they are very, very intelligent, and they can use a human communication system in limited ways to allow us to test that intelligence. Um, and again, I, I, we use this a little bit of, of explanation. We, we really hope that this, this, these data, okay, can be used to improve the care of companion animals so people understand that they've got these creatures that are about the level of a kindergarten child in their houses. Um, we've used in the past, used the model rival technique to help children, autistic children, gain some level of communicative ability. And again, because people tend to like to conserve creatures that are more like themselves, we hope that this will help with some kind of conservation efforts in the wild. So I want to thank you very much for listening. It's been a pleasure to share my data with you, and I hope I've made the morning pass in somewhat of a pleasant way for you all. Thank you. Thank you, Irene. Um, We're good. This is working. Yes, it, it is working. So thank you very much. Uh, this raises a lot of questions, and I, I have a few questions for <laughs> you before. Maybe we, we ask the audience if they have some questions. But one of them I think David Premack would have asked. Uh, you showed us some data showing remarkable linguistic abilities of these animals, and then you showed us some abilities which are more of executive control, let's say the ability to inhibit the response to the marshmallow right. or equivalent, or the ability to inhibit being distracted by the size when you really want to go for quantity and so on. And um, I wonder whether there is a link between the two in the sense that being language trained gives these animals additional cognitive yeah. abilities. And what is your evidence yeah. uh, for that? I think it's most apparent in the number work, OK? Because giving the birds the ability to symbolize these quantities means that they understand it exactly. If you look at most of the studies, only those apes that have had symbolic representation training can do that exact abilities. The other ones are always doing it basic on a Weber's law type system. So I think that's, that's the best, best evidence, that, that giving them this ability to symbolize them allows them to do this exact number work. For instance, in the probability task, is there any evidence that this sort of uh, capacity for probability would not be available if they had not been language trained? Uh, the beauty of the infant work is that it's done without language at all. Right? Exactly. It's just based on surprise. Yeah. So if you use this non-linguistic test, would you think you would see a difference between the language trained versus the non-language trained? Well, I, I think the interesting thing is, again, when you, use, when you have the language training, you can track better exactly what's going on. You can ask the child, well, why did you choose this? And you see the younger children say, you know, because it's my favorite color, versus, oh, because that's the mostest. Whereas with the, you know, pre-verbal children, you're, impl you're in making an inference about how their knowledge is working. And it's not bad. I mean, it's a good way of starting it. I mean, the problem is, like, if you go to the very original number work, with, um, with Karen Wynn's original number work, with the one versus two Mickey Mouses. And you know, she put up, for the people who don't know this, she put up a screen where she showed that there was like you know, one Mickey Mouse, and then the screen would come up, and then the screen would come down, there were two Mickey Mouses, and the child would look more when the number was different. But I mean, it didn't control for mass. It didn't control for, what if you put up a Mickey Mouse and a Donald Duck? You'd get the same 
response. Just because you are only controlling number, you're assuming that the child is basing it on number. But the child is just responding to a difference. You don't know if the child is process what the child is really processing. Is it processing a number difference, or is it processing just something's different here? I disagree with you on this, actually. I, I, I think that many of these studies are well controlled, and it's a very interesting finding that the linguistic young child does not necessarily access the knowledge that we are able to see yeah. with non-linguistic paradigms, no. even in much younger infants. Yeah. But I, I don't think we should question that these tasks, when they are well controlled, demonstrate that there is, yeah, for I'm, instance, I'm, a probability sense. Yeah. As I said, uh, they, there were, you know, they did additional controls to try to rule those things out to make sure that this was basing it on. But again, these were pre-hoc versus post-hoc. And there's some interesting papers, you know, suggesting that it's a more difficult task when you're doing it post-hoc versus... Instance, in the, I, I, a few years ago, I taught a course on the Bayesian abilities and probabilistic abilities. And the, the task you describe from Luca Bonatti and Josh Tenenbaum and so on, one of the controls they have in this um, situation, they have three blue objects and one yellow object. And you're absolutely right, when they are surprised when a yellow object comes yeah. out, you could argue that it's just because this is the rare object. That's essentially what they are arguing, but it could also be that it's the less boring object in a sense of sense because the blue yeah. are more numerous, they've seen them more often. The nice control is then they show an urn where there is a separation in between, so yes. that the yellow object is the only one that can come out. Right. The blue objects cannot right. come so they out, understood they are, they yeah. are physically so they understood separated. They yeah. And then the results reverse, reverse right. completely. So this right. shows that it's really yes. probabilities yeah. rather than just being bored yeah. about a specific type well, of Well, as object. I said, I said so they did the right. additional Has, they did so, additional control. So I think we're that. left with a very interesting fact, which may also be true yeah. of the parrot, that the language system redescribes the existing abilities, and it does not do so very quickly. It takes a lot of time for for the verbal behavior to be fully reflective of the actual cognitive right. abilities yeah. that uh, young children. I have. agree, so but I think I think giving the symbolic ability gives additional power. Mm. I mean, I think in a sense that's why. You know why we are we can do these mathematics because we do the we can play with these symbols and think in symbols and I think it's an additional you know it's an additional layering that allows additional level of power that's my, what I'm trying to get at. Yeah. Maybe we can take a question in the room uh, if you have. 